Welcome to Comedy on the Edge with your host, Francis Domeno, The Wrong Hero. Well, this is the, um, this is the fourth Comedy on the Edge. I can't believe we've made it this far. Four of them in five months. And, uh, well, I thought that instead of beginning with uh, one of our usual comics, we would begin this particular comedy on the edge with somebody who has never become one before. His name is Brian Hughes, and let's hear, let's hear it for him. Let's give it up for Brian Hughes. Got a little extra material I want to try out here. I want to talk a little bit about dating and how complicated dating has become in modern times. I mean, was it, has it always been so difficult and so complex? I mean, how is it? How do you think it was in the Stone Age? You think? You think cavemen? You think I cavemen really had an easy time dating? Well, yeah, I'd say it was probably. Well, you know, I'm wondering what what actually did single cavemen do? You know, for example, did single cavemen go to singles dances? Yes, there'll be a dance tonight at the newly refurbished Club Decay. <laughs> You'll be dancing to your favorite rock music. There'll also be a hot buffet featuring steamship round of brontosaurus. I'm your host, Dick Syed, of the Dick Syed Hotline Dating Show. I'll have the first names and phone numbers of single cave people throughout your local area. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if some anthropologist revealed that uh, the etchings on some cave wall were actually personal ads for cavemen. You know, picture this. SWM. Brown hair all over my body. Sloping forehead, baby blue eyes. Enjoys dinosaur hunting, rock climbing, and long walks through the jungle. Looking for nurturing SWF with similar interests to go clubbing with. Of course, you know what the caveman's idea or concept of clubbing was. He'd swing an oversized Louisville slugger, he'd uh, give his girl a couple of taps to the head, and once to the knees for good measure. Then she'd slink to the ground, she'd grab her injured knee and say, why me, why me? Okay, maybe the Nancy Kerrigan jokes are a little stale. Anyway, he grabs her by the ponytail, he drags her to the cave, and that's how relationships started back in the good old days. Of course, by today's standards, this kind of behavior may be viewed as somewhat abusive. If only he could find his inner cave child. So anyway, imagine a typical date back in the Stone Age. First, the caveman would uh, drag his date home to his bachelor cave. He'd build a nice romantic fire and proceed to cook a dinner over the fire. And then, of course, they'd have dinner by firelight. They didn't have candles back in those days, so he'd have to build a fire in the middle of the table. Of course, they'd have to eat very quickly. Then they'd proceed to push the remainder of the table after dinner into the main fire for kindling. <laughs> after dinner they'd cozy up to the fire and that's when the good stuff would begin you know foreplay in the stone age is not a lot different from the way it is now the caveman would smack his date on the lips a few times maybe give her a little tap behind the ear maybe once to the nape of the neck whatever's turning her on ultimately he'd switch clubs I don't think they worry too much about dating in the days of the Roman Empire, do you? In the days of the Roman Empire were a lot like the 1960s, you know, love the one you're with. Actually, back then, they loved the dozen or so people they happened to be with. You know, they, they believed in group dating back in the Roman Empire. Ultimately, the Roman Empire, Empire rose and fell, and but they tried to make a comeback with the Holy Roman Empire, but it was kind of lame as comebacks go. Kind of like Peter Frampton, you know? Well, and you know, you get a period of about a thousand or so years where there's no record of recorded history, no, no recorded history at all, and I was always wondering how that kind of thing happened. You know, did everybody just kind of go on a bender and, and forget what happened? You know, didn't it occur to anybody to write anything down? I have a theory about this. 
My theory is that we've repressed the memory. We've submerged it deep into our unconscious because something really traumatic, really terrible must have happened. Kind of like the 1970s. Yeah. Anybody remember the 70s? Yeah. Does anybody want to remember the 70s? Yeah. Now we had the Partridge Family, Barry Manilow, Casey and the Sunshine Band, Debbie Boone, the Bee Gees, Saturday Night Fever, two-tone shirts, nylon, two-tone shoes, nylon shirts, leisure suits, Watergate, Jimmy Carter, Disco, shall I go on? Sure. <laughs> Why? It was pretty dramatic. It was really a pretty horrible memory. And, you know, it's no wonder we've forgotten. I, I think that maybe there was a thousand years like the 1970s during the Middle Ages. But mankind survived and we regained our consciousness and we went on to have the, the Renaissance and the Age of Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, and we, you know, we're back on track now, we're okay. You know, we've survived to pollute the planet, put a hole in the ozone layer, put ourselves on the verge of nuclear destruction, you know, we're doing okay. Actually, I think in a couple of generations we may have people who actually forget the 20th century. That's it, thank you very much. What can I say? Brian Hughes and Shelley Berman for the 90s. Incredible. Fantastic new material by Brian Hughes. So let's, uh, yeah, really good stuff. Good stuff, good stuff. But Brian left out a couple of things. So. Pong. You know, someday pointy-headed aliens from the 55th century are going to look at Pong and say, Imagine, these primitive hominids had this incredibly savage game that they referred to by the name of Pong. You know, I mean, so I don't know. It, it's, it's hard to say, but, well, okay, 1970s, that was 20 years ago. What are people going to say about, uh, what people are going to say about the 1970s, 100 years from now, or what? We think of the 1890s now, like, um, you know, oh, Jack the Ripper, um, corsets, um, uh, buggy whips, you know. I mean, this is going to be an incredible caricature. They're going to squeeze it down into three things. So what would the 90s be? What would the three things about the 90s be? Um, primitive computers in which you could hand write, but it would, wouldn't read your signature correctly. Um, what else did these savages from the 1990s have? Uh, oh yes, primitive nuclear devices which, which, which spread radioactivity everywhere and polluted the environment instead of our far more sophisticated technology which kills people with electromagnetic pulses with none of the inconvenient radiation. And, uh, oh yes, they're primitive internal combustion engines, whereas, of course, nowadays we have teleportation by what they would call fax machines. So, I don't know, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to bug it all out. But, uh, Brian, that was magnificent. And my name is Francis Domeno, and this concludes this portion of Comedy on the Edge. And we'll be back next week with more Comedy on the Edge. Please stay tuned.
which of course is why it's crucial that there not be any distracting movements behind him on stage. Let's have a warm welcome for Kevin Cotter. Basically, I'm here to my parole officer said I needed to get a job, so I'll tell him it worked today. The girlfriend was supposed to come by too, but she had other plans. Well, actually, she said she'd rather run shit in here than come and see me. But, um, yeah, I've been going with her for about a year now, and it's it's, it's kind of neat. She still calls me by that same little cute nickname she used to call me right at the beginning. She calls me two pumps and a squirt. I don't know where she got that one from. No, actually, I'm here because um, I was sent here by a tour agency. I'm looking for work and was either the midnight to eight at the Diamond Diaper Factory, a spokesman for a major tobacco company, or this place. And I'm in enough shit, so I don't need that tobacco company job. Did anybody uh, see that on the news? That the, the spokesman, the CEO of the seven biggest tobacco companies in the world. Or in America, close enough. Well, all before a congressional committee, and they told them that cigarettes aren't bad for you, they're not addictive, and there's no nicotine is not addictive. And I just like to watch it because it was good to see these people lying. They knew they were lying. Everybody knew they were lying, but they were squirming over it. It reminded me of bosses I had when I used to have to call my and this work. And they knew it was Monday, so I was like loaded all weekend. And I would tell them that the dog got hit by a bus, so I couldn't come in. And they would say, you know, I got hit again. Whatever. Um, oh, yeah, speaking of lying politicians. What happened to the health care plan I was supposed to get? Anybody know? I, I actually saw a copy of it. It's about that thick, and it doesn't have a dental plan in it. And the last time I had a real health care plan, it didn't have a dental plan in it. Um, what do they think dentists are? Do they put them in the same categories like magicians and astrologers? <laughs> you can't have a dentist? That's, I don't know, I think it's weird. I don't know who the lobbyists are or the dental people are. But it's like, they need new lobbyists for something. People just tell them, no, I'm not going to do dental. Um, I don't know. Things haven't been going too well for me lately. I just, Life to me, like, I have this picture of life as like this big evil grandmother type. It's like, get me a headlock and say, go ahead, Lock. eat some shit. Come on, eat a little more shit. Eat some shit. I don't know, I guess you have to eat it. Um, oh yeah, I've been going with the job interviews all over the place. and um, I don't like them, I don't think anybody does. It's, it's like a, a one hour lining session. And uh, but I do pretty good at it. The only part I don't do good at is because I prepare for the questions and all that. They always take me by surprise. They look at me and say, hey, do you have any questions for us? I never know what to say. Um, it's the, the first things that come into my mind are things like, does your health plan cover a crack addiction? Um, and other questions I have are like, who put the alphabet in office? What if they made a mistake? That's your problem, man. Yeah, I think it's not running like that. All right, I'll end it with one joke that um, you can take home with you. And Asha walked into a theater and uh, get ready for the show to start again. He wants to make it all clear out. He sees a guy lying across five seats. He looks at him and goes, hey, one seat at the other. You can't take them off, it's going to be a sold out show. And the guy just looks up at him and goes, Whoa! He goes, Listen, I want to get the manager. And I just went, Whoa! So he gets the manager and he comes down and said, You can't lie across five seats. You gotta go. Same thing, he looks up at him and he goes, Whoa! And the manager says, I'm getting the cops. He comes back in with the cop. The cop says, I'm going to tell you what, sit in one seat and you have to leave. And the guy just looks up at him and he goes, Whoa! He goes, all right, buddy. He goes, where'd you come from anyway? He goes, the balcony. <laughs> um, that's all I have for now. Thanks.
bringing it all back home. Well, I'm good to see all you folks out there. Right by. Yeah. Let's have a big hand unless you're using it. Uh, well, That was Kevin Carter. Brian Hughes, our next act. A chair form, Brian Hughes. sexually, socially transmitted diseases are really getting out of hand. But I don't worry about those because I always practice safe sex. In fact, actually, it's my partners that practice safe sex. Truth is, I ask women to go to bed with me and they just say no. I get a rim shot at that point. You know, they say today that when you sleep with someone, you're actually sleeping with everyone that they've ever gone to bed with. That's why I'm dating Wilt Chamberlain. That's right, me and Wilt are still learning. I, I figure that once I nail Wilt, I'm going to be able to tell people that I've slept with 20,000 women. That'll run the grand total up to 20,001. Not to mention everybody that she's ever slept with. And I was born and raised on a farm, so you know I'm not even including barnyard animals in that total. I'm only kidding, I wasn't born on a farm. Has anybody seen the movie The Piano? Great movie, wasn't it? Abhi Gaitel. That's right, Abhi Gaitel. It was featured prominently in that movie. You said it. You know, it really was a very special movie, and, and I really liked it because it's not your typical Hollywood movie. You know, it was written and directed by a woman and it featured female sensuality. And, and part of what made this movie very, very special and very controversial as well, as we've already alluded to, is the fact that it featured a few scenes of explicit frontal male nudity. Doesn't that expression run shivers down your spine, frontal male nudity? You know, I was a little apprehensive when I walked in the theater. I wasn't quite sure how I was going to handle it because, you know, shit. I'm still getting over finding out the secret to the crying game, you know what I mean? But, you know, I paid my six bucks, I walked into the theater, and, you know, after I watched the movie, I said, you know, this, this really isn't so bad, you know? It was really very tastefully done, you know? It contributed to the character development and the plot and storyline, and, uh, you know, it was really very, very beautiful thing, very, you know, artistic and aesthetically pleasing, so help me to think of it. You know, Hollywood's been making motion pictures for nearly a hundred years, you know, there's supposedly been this golden age of Hollywood. I don't think they've really properly exploited this frontal male nudity thing. I'm just thinking they would have done frontal male nudity from the very beginning. You know, Charlie Chaplin, you know, with his little hat and cane and the walk. Always would have had some place to put his hat and cane. There's a great old movie out in the 40s called Key Lago, you know, Humphrey Bogart, Edward G. Robinson. It's a great scene when they're on the boat, thunderstorm going on overhead. Imagine the two of them squaring off with each other. They're all off. Looks like my compass is pointing the wall. I'm going to proceed in a northerly, northerly direction. Now, what are you talking about, see? My compass is pointing south. Yeah. Let's turn this boat around. Yeah, I got a rod, see? I'm not afraid to use it. <laughs> How about Jimmy Stewart in that old Yuletide classic, It's a Wonderful Life? Remember the scene when he was running down Main Street, Main Street there? Imagine him streaking down Main Street. Hello, movie house! Jesus, it's cold out here. Well, hello, Uncle Billy! Jesus, yeah. 
you dumb brat. Old bastard, put some clothes on, but for land's <laughs> sakes alive, Billy. Why don't you get down to the gym and do some Nautilus or something? What a diet, land's sakes, you look like hell. Put some clothes on. Oh, what the hell are you looking at? Oh, what do you mean it's small? It ain't small. Why, why it's big enough for my Mary. Right, with the father and six children, and land's sake. Six more than you ever sired, you, you fat old alcoholic bastard. Put some clothes on. You look like hell. You're making me sick. I yeah, finally imagine uh, Ronald Reagan, that time for Bonzo. This, this is actually something that ended up on the cutting room floor. It was from the, pr the proposed X-rated version of Bedtime for Bonzo. Well, well, they've got me doing a nude scene with a, with a chimpanzee. Geez, I was always hoping for Jane Russell. Maybe I'll just close my eyes and make believe that it's Nancy. Yeah, that won't take too much to it. Yeah, but imagine that, me doing a naked scene with a chimp wife. And that's no, they'll, they'll be voting me governor of California. Maybe president of the United States. Nah, that's too much of a stretch. Thank you very much. Distractions. This may be the last chance you get. You better do it. And I'll tell Steve's jokes for him. I'll do ten minutes if you don't. No. All right. Well, I guess uh, short but sweet and comedy on the edge is now probably over for this week. And uh, we hope you come back next week. Hey, Steve, at least come up and say something. No. All right, well, save up all that material for next week and bring it in. And good night. Thanks to Kevin Carter, Brian Hughes, and all the fine committed talent we've assembled. And we hope to see you all next week. This is Comedy on the Edge, and we're throwing out the first pitch of the season with Steve Iskovitz as the designated pitcher, and Ed Hogan as catcher, and Brian Melvin as the umpire. Whoops. Well. Strike. That was lefty. He ate. You want the stage off or something? Oh, yeah. No, no, you, guys, you guys keep farting around. It's all right. After all, baseball is more important than comedy. As a matter of fact, everything's more important in comedy. Yeah, I like baseball. I didn't like playing baseball, but uh, I like watching the parents beat the crap out of each other. Okay. Oh, and when you got when you got the bean ball? There's always be some fat lady yelling at the coach for not playing her fat son. What are you supposed to do? Wheel him out and uh, wheel him out the first base? Last time they put a fat in the kid ate it. As soon as he learns a home plate isn't a dinner special, maybe we'll play them. Yeah, the home plate, blue plate special. Yeah, right, right. Batter's box is not a luncheon dinner. A luncheon special you buy at 7-Eleven. Have you eat those things? Oh, God. The freaking cardboard is the best part. You gotta eat the, gotta eat the box just to get some nutrition in your diet. A little fiber, huh? <laughs> a little fiber. That yeah, stuff's got the nutritional value of a sock. What's that? Those luncheon things? Oh, those things you're trying to push on your kids? I don't know who they try to push on. You gotta be a drug addict to eat it though. The carefully allocated sections of cholesterol. Who goes to these yeah. stores? Drug addicts and immigrants who don't kids. know what a 500% markup means, you know? <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> oh, tube of toothpaste! In my country, $10! Here, 5 
Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, another fine Saturday afternoon at the Middle East. Uh, it's, uh, so what's up, man? What's new? What's new in your life? What's new, what's new in my life? No, what's new in my life? <clears throat> what's new in my life? What's new in my life? But I'll be like the Tonight Show. Okay. Amazing Christ. <laughs> what is it old in my life? What is... <laughs> Shit stain on Steve's underwear. Yeah, right. What's that so was just made as you walked in. Hey, that sounds like a Jeopardy question. <laughs> Imagine how they That's had that for they had that for bachelors. Uh, what is laying on the couch and eating Doritos? Uh, that would be myself, Alex. Saturday night. Oh, in a question? Who is it? Who is me? Yeah. <laughs> what is Saturday Who? night at the bachelor pad? What's that? For five hundred. What is a drunk slug? Uh, that would be me also. Spring cleaning for 100. Uh, uh, getting a St. Bernard dog and wiping my hands on him. Right. 2001 uses for an underwear. Okay, uh, hey, speaking of, any you guys hear about that uh, the dog that was abused? Yeah. Wasn't that awful? Yeah, Boy, I tell you, man, that Tom Arnold guy is a bastard. <laughs> I can't believe he did that. I mean, just abused Roseanne. Oh, you're talking about that other dog? Yeah, that, that was pretty bad, too. A German Shepherd's the third most intelligent dog. How could it get into a mess like that? I tell you, I hope they ch find the chick that did it. Because uh, they're not going to have any mercy on her. <laughs> I hope they, everyone keeps saying, I hope they find the guy. Like a chick's incapable of it. You know? John Wayne Bob is rock, walking around like Frank and Dick, but no, no way could a chick bury a dog. No, but when they find that guy, man, I hope they do the same, the same thing to him as they did to the dog. Just bury him up to his head and then run him over with a lawnmower. No, wait. That'd be too nice. You want him to suffer. Maybe uh, maybe just weed whack his face. And then use his head as a golf tee. And then run him over with a lawnmower. What do you think? No? The mayor of Providence says... Hey, let me tell you something. My sister had a dog neutered. You know, because the thing takes off for like days at a time. You know what I mean? A guy wouldn't do that. A guy would give, give the dog five bucks and tell him to have fun. I asked my dog if I could go with him the last time. I'm not kidding. My sister takes her dog home from the, the vet. The thing's declawed, neutered, ears clipped. Looks like I got hit by a truck. I go out and just saw his freaking legs off and throw him on the couch. Be a fat, lazy old like your husband, only not quite as hairy. And then you hear about uh, what's it, that guy that uh, cut off, he severed his own penis. You hear about that? Yeah. The guy in prison? You didn't hear about this? No. Oh, well, gather around the Christmas tree, children. <laughs> Let me tell you a little story. Well, this guy, he really did. He cut, cut off his own dick and he flushed it. Now, what a tough son of a bitch. Imagine fighting him. See some guy, uh, yeah, you want to fight? You don't want a piece of me, man. I'm a black belt karate, third degree taekwondo, and I, taekwondo, I can bench press a truck. Oh, yeah? Well, I cut off my own penis. Then flush it. <laughs> it's cool. They got it before it reached the ocean, though. Good thing, because I wouldn't want to be illegal seafoods and uh, <laughs> give a new meaning to the swordfish special, huh? The eel soup. <laughs> yeah, right. And imagine the guy who uh, caught it. It's probably on the dock. Cod, salmon, mackerel. Cod, salmon, mackerel. Cut. Holy mackerel. What the? <laughs> What the? Cod, salmon, mackerel. <clears throat> oh, good grief. Cod is it's probably taking, probably taking, yeah, right. Cod oh, yeah. Maybe it's, it's white fish with big worms in it. Well, if it was a black fish, they probably would have needed a bigger boat. Black South Boston. Ah, the infamous black fish. He doesn't come, on, he must be here to mate. He doesn't come around here too often. He smells tuna. <laughs> Could have been like uh, Mrs. Paul's fish stick. Hey, you cross out the missus and the fish, you got a new dinner. You know, look at that. <laughs> you got to think about that. What else is I going to say? Uh, yeah, I can see the fisherman taking pictures with, the, with his buddy. <laughs> or if it's a girl. Uh, to come out of line. What else is going on? Uh, I hate shows. 
I hate, I went to the movies, see Steven Scow's movie. And I hate movies that are unrealistic, but I hate people that have to remind me that they're not realistic every two seconds. I had this Nimrod in front of me kept saying, oh, that's not real. Oh, that can't happen. Can we get behind one of these idiots? Oh, that, that couldn't happen. No way. I'm like, yeah, you're right, that's not real. And neither is the pain you're gonna feel when I bash my foot off the back of your head. What else? Uh, I dream of genie, that's not realistic. Guy could add anything he wanted. He's working for the government. What was he in the Air Force or something? Yeah, right. I'd like to see my mailman show up Monday after winning Megabucks. And he'd show up as he's doing a whole shot across my lawn, dumping my letters in the garbage. He'd probably wipe a big snot on my tax return and tell me I could shove my Christmas tip up my head. What else? Gilligan's Island, seven stranded castaways? There were seven slobs. I'm not kidding. I never seen once in Gilligan change his underwear. His old, he never changed his clothes. He must have had a skid stain on his underwear the size of the island that they could have peeled off and walked across it to safety. Yeah, it could have been like a happy ending, like the Wizard of Oz. Only instead of follow the yellow brick road, it could have been walk across Gilligan's big brown bridge of shit. Uh, some people are entirely too nice, like uh, Richard Simmons. What's up with that infinite bastard? Let me tell you something, I don't know what's worse, being 600 pounds overweight and having that slob come over. How would you entertain him? Hi right, Rich, can I get you something, uh, a cup of coffee, some tea, uh, a dick? And who else, that painter guy on TV? You know that guy looks like he got a, a tumbleweed taped to his head? That dude is entirely too nice. Oh, let's see, maybe we'll just make a happy mountain over here, and maybe just uh, a little tree friend over here. Oh, let's say we make a, a little happy rock over here. Now, there's something you see every day. Uh, for Christ's sakes, I was walking home and I saw these two rocks and they were just laughing and joking and oh, just having a good old time. And I came off my acid trip. What's this guy doing, drugs? Probably sniffing. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, that's at the end of the day, all the mutants come out. Yeah, sort of like South Station during rush hour. Only they're not quite as funny looking. Yeah, it's a little like a Boston parade. I like Boston parades. That's yeah, similar to Disneyland, except there aren't quite as many drunk Irish kids beating each other up at Disneyland. Yeah, uh, plus Disneyland, unlike Boston, only has one fairy in its parade, and I'm pretty sure it's heterosexual. Every child. Yeah, speaking of those, uh, Breakfast, Francis. Ever eat those Great Star breakfasts from uh, from 7-Eleven? No. Oh man, Great Star to an Elsa. You know, my mother used to feed me those Swanson frozen dinners. I don't mind. You know, I don't mind frozen dinners, but not from the Ice Age. Let me tell you something. I had this Salisbury steak that tasted like it came from a Brontosaurus with this mashed pterodactyl shit. I'm looking at him. Who made this crap? Chef Boy Leaky? At least it wasn't burnt like everything else my mother cooked. Uh, apparently, fire wasn't invented when they wrote the instructions. I take a Jurassic dump after eating. The only thing that was good was uh, the dessert. I think it was Barney's left nut or something. <laughs> <laughs> Barney's left nut petrified uh, around uh, frozen something. So. Petrified. Petrified, yeah, right. Petrified, there you go. I'm going to use that tonight. Where, where did you perform tonight? Uh, what's it called? Remington's? Tell us about it. Well, it's like this dungeon. It's called the vault, actually, downstairs, because it used to be an old bank or something. How'd you get that? Place? Bank slash prison slash Seda's house. It's uh, on Beacon Street, I think. Some place in Boston, where the rich upper class socialites hang out. They only let let us lowly scumbags in when we do something to entertain them. They get that. They the, the they, what do they call quiet humor from? Yeah. What would be a good, good word for that? Uh, introspective humor. Yeah. 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 No, what do you call when someone gets something? They acquire, no, they yeah. don't. When you, when you get, some, get something from someone, you would appreciate. appreciate humor from someone? No, I wouldn't say that. Yeah. No? No? Well, no. no, let me tell you something about comics. I fucking hate comics, all right? They're the most sensitive people in the world. Like, for example, last week, right? I'm up on stage doing some comics act, you know, verbatim, and he comes over to me and says, you know, hey, listen, you know, I gotta go up after you, now I have nothing to say. So he gets up there, and he didn't, he just stood there for a half an hour, not saying anything, but in desperation, he tried a few of my jokes. Now, my jokes suck, so naturally he bombed. 
so that's why. That's uh, why. Right. Tell us how you got booked into Remington. You uh, well, Francis. No, go to one other people's material. No, no, I mean, uh, who did you have to see? Who did I? Have? Well, Francis, I had to suck a lot of dick in my life. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I had to sleep my way to the top. No, I'm just kidding. That's not even funny. Do gay guys get horny when they see their own dick? <laughs> well, they did. I know if I was gay, I'd be psyched. Waking up in the morning. All right, a dick. No, I'd say. <laughs> Every time. Hey, how you doing? Hey, how are you? Good. You want to come how back to the jokes? Yeah, well, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> come on, tell me jokes. Well, right after you. Well, where's your chin? Where's your chin? Where's your chin? Did you go up yet? Yeah? Oh, no. He's doing his yes to... Uh, I'm doing the sign. I'm still writing the Great American Novel. Francis, pretty soon you're going to need uh, some roadies. Right. With all those things you take off. <laughs> 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 Let's see, what else can I say? Remington. No, that place is sort of a dump. I don't know. Let's see, I, I just, the reason I'm sort of like uh, being verbose is because I, I have all these things I wrote. If I figure, if I think about them now, maybe I can figure some things out. I don't know, name a subject. Uh, waterfalls. 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 Why would you name waterfalls? Hey, do you know, there's a test that you could do. I don't know if it's uh, comedic or anything. Where, you know, like, you, you know, you say a word, like, you know, dog, and then you say, have someone say something back. And there are about five different things that, you know, people will always respond to. You know, like, dog, say, cat. Uh, kills chickens, shits in the corner. Or... Yeah, 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 something like that. <laughs> well, in Harvard, around this place, probably, probably don't make too much sense. You know, like you say, uh, I don't know, beer. Uh, recycle trash. Uh, you don't buy beer, you rent it. Yeah. Name another subject. Uh, so, um, uh, India. India. Word, man. Word. <laughs> Indians are the funniest people in the world. Even if they're mad, you can't tell they're mad. See a guy in a fight, in a fight? You want a piece of me? Come on. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on. You want to try me? Come on. I'll punch you in the head. Gotta work on my uh, imitations a little bit. Name another subject. Irish in here? Yeah, I was a little drunk Irish. Man. My my brother married a Jewish girl. He had a beautiful kid. He walked into one, a wall the other day with the heart on and broke his nose. So uh, nice kid. My parents weren't too happy about him marrying outside the marriage, so. I had to always outdo my big brother, so I married a Satanist, and uh, the wedding was a little awkward, you know, we brought the priest, and she brought Satan, and uh, she spun her head around and threw up all over the place, so that was a little strange. Donna was her bridesmaid. Name another subject. Steve, name a subject. I don't know. <laughs> Cigarettes. Yeah, I'm gonna start. And I bought stock, stock in. Uh, I bought stock in. Uh, look at that! They don't even put their name on this. They're smart. Philip Morris. Philip Morris. I bought stock in Phil, Philip Morris because I, I believe people are really starting to come around to smokers. Maybe I'll be a leper. I'm in. A, I'm in a bar the other day. This guy tells me is my smoking offends him. I'm like, yeah, like that fight you just cut really doesn't offend me at all. Okay. Hey, can I break in for a second yeah. here? I got something that really bugs me. All right. All these people who say, you're smoking your fence me. They drive cars. Try sticking your fucking lips around your exhaust pipe, pal. All right? That would have really offended you now, wouldn't it? <laughs> Francis, I think we should stop charging these secondhand smokers for the smoke that we are buying. <laughs> That's what I think. That's exactly right. Name another subject. Uh, it's back to the smoking Jose. Uh, yeah. Hotel bar in San Jose. Yeah. You couldn't smoke. At, at a bar. At, a, at, the, at the bar in a hotel, you couldn't smoke. Yeah, right. You can go home drinking and driving, and running right. someone over, but right. you can't smoke. Right. You know, and then and then you take the train, and on the side of the train, you uh, they have a billboard saying, uh, by the time you reach. Uh, go home today, 
three people would be dead from secondhand smoke. Yeah, I could think of a lot worse shit that goes on. Yeah, like the murderer. They don't have any murders pictures up there. What's that, Steve? The Pope is going to be visiting Baltimore. Well, they say all the people that Jesus loves. You know, the degenerate scumbags and nitwits. And Baltimore is a perfect place. John Waters is going to film it. John Waters, who's that? He's the guy that does uh, shampoo and hairdo. And, uh, is he going to film it? Nah. John? Now he's a degenerate filmmaker. He has, oh, really? He has a serial mom out now. Oh, oh, is that his film? Yeah. Right, what's that, Steve? He's coming to New Jersey first. Oh, the Pope. Yeah. As I said, <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you something. If you don't know where New Jersey is, all right, say this is the turnpike going through New York. You take a right, and that'll take, and then you take the first right into the bathroom. And, and you know that toilet seat that's there with all the uh, puke and vile urine on it? Well, that's not New Jersey. New Jersey would be that lump of shit on the floor next to the toilet with the vile urine on it. What do you think, Francis? Well, you know what? Is that pretty Del good? Del Del no, Jersey's bad, but Delaware is Jersey's trash can. Okay? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay, here's New Jersey. Travel down the turnpike, New Jersey right about there. <laughs> you from Jersey? What a dump. I'm from Pennsylvania, so Steve. Pennsylvania, Amish country, country, right? Sure, that's Amish country, look! <laughs> <All right. laughs> so is your cow parked out front? No, I'll tell you though, uh, it's really something. What, Just Pennsylvania? Like Pennsylvania, the Amish, they're only in the eastern part. We're from western Pennsylvania. We have the amphetamine addicts who are like former veterans and their hands shake so bad they can't drink a cup of coffee without spilling it like, you know, halfway between Pittsburgh right, right. and Wheeling, you know? It's like zzzz. Yeah, they shake, they shake it when it's, they open their milk. Uh, it's probably the, the Amish that didn't fit in so well. <laughs> probably. They're probably, uh... <coughs> Snorting the cream or something. What else, Steve? Anything else? Any other subjects? Name another subject. Ah, yeah, uh, save it for the show. I'll do your act, Steve. <laughs> yeah, do an impression of me. Do an impression of everyone. Okay. Damn it! Damn it! Damn it! Francis, don't break that. <laughs> Look what you're doing. You just broke that thing again. Francis, get off it. Jeez. Okay. Steve. Uh, well, I've been working at a mental institution. And, uh, you know, people always ask me if I fit in well there. And, uh, you know, but I believe they're really smart, the Edith Savants. They, uh, that's it. <laughs> How many does that? Anyone else? Who else can I imitate? Uh, geez. Johnny Moe. And man's down a ball! Richard Nixon? Want to see me doing an imitation yeah, of Richard, Richard Nixon? That's it. Right, I'll be <laughs> I can do an imitation of Richard Nixon now. That's it. He's dead. I am not a crook. I tell you, they, they play these people up like they said on the news that, uh, that Richard Nixon, uh, what was it? One thing you can never say, you can never call him a quitter. What are you talking about? He quit. You know what I mean? It's the truth, though. It's the truth. It's like it makes anyone sound good. Let's see, who else? Hitler. Hitler. How can I talk about like Hitler? What was that thing they said about Hitler's dog? He killed his dog. Did you know that, Francis? Yeah, just before he committed suicide. Yeah, why did he do that? His dog had puppies or something like that? Because it was a German Shepherd. He didn't want to mix him with inferior breeds. Is that true? No, no. <laughs> That'd be good, though. That'd be good. I know. You probably want to have, have a mate with a white Anglo Saxon blonde. The, the dog's name was Blondie. Oh, really? Really? He was afraid Dagwood was going to come around. He's a dachshund, you know. He's Hitler. Young Volt. That's about it. Thanks a lot. Back to the future. Back to the future. Yes. Ugh. You know what? I stink. I don't belong up here. I'm sorry I ever came up here. 
I'm sorry, folks. I guess I wasted your time. You know, uh, this is a hard job, and, well, no, I, I'm sorry. I should save all that stuff for when, like, um, people are actually walking out. Um, or, yes, uh, I'm freezing up now. I don't know what to say. I'm afraid. Oh, okay, here we go. My saver. Here he is. Whoa! 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 This is what happens when cousins marry. Here he is, the fantastic, fantabulous, outrageous, and um, unique Stephen Iskovich. Smoke me sometime, you know? How about, how about an for Doritos to, for like, uh, like anorexics and bulimics and stuff? Be like, oh, I can't remember. I had a good joke for Scott. Well, I need, I need some Freon, so. Oh, that's horrible. Do you know that there's actually Freon in cigarettes? Freon? Yeah. Yes, I have an article right here from the Globe from a week or two ago. It said that, you know that big thing about there were 500 chemicals that they put in cigarettes, it was a secret, and no one thought that it was illegal to tell anybody? Yeah. Well, NPR actually scooped, uh, got a scoop on like 13 of them. And there's the article in the Globe, which for some reason only mentions 7 of the 13, but they are ammonia, freon, ethyl furoid, and sclariol, and a couple others. But uh, ethyl furoid is actually was actually discussed as a possible chemical warfare agent in the 1930s. They actually put it in fucking in cigarettes. Oh, they put they put arsenic in them too, or is it cyanide? I forget which. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, what's uh, the French have known this for years. They're required to put the uh, list of ingredients on every pack. Really? Like uh, five percent of a Marlboro is additives. Wow. Hey, this mic is better. Um, well, you, you, were, you were making jokes about Jews and Catholics and stuff. So I can tell my joke about, uh, you know, like I'm Jewish and I grew up in a Catholic neighborhood. And um, I used to always feel really weird on Friday nights because the Catholic kids all eat fish. You know, like the Catholics only eat fish on Friday nights. But the Jews had to, like, observe the Sabbath and the fast. So, you know, like, I didn't want to break the Jewish uh, thing and eat, but I didn't want to. I wanted to be like the Catholic kids and eat fish, so. Every Friday night, I just used to go down with my girlfriend. Uh, Look, if you're gonna die, you know, just, just don't fall on me, you know? 
don't know. It's like, I think people around here are kind of like socially retarded, you know. And back where I'm from Pittsburgh, and people are much more social, you know. They're retarded in every other way, but. Like, if, if, any, if anyone around here has something to say, if anyone there has anything to say, they say it. But they just don't have as much to say. I feel like Linda Johnson, you know. Did we see that movie about Linda Johnson a couple weeks ago? He said, how do you feel? And he goes, how do I feel? I just had my appendix out. And, no, I just lost my appendix and won the election. I feel great. You want to see my cross stitches? That's some piece of workmanship, huh? Uh, I'm doing a movie called One Plus One is Two. Uh, the plot's a little thin, but it's going to have really good special effects. I'm going to start a rap group that does songs about the, the uh, where's Francis? Half jokes that are, it's going to be about the uh, economy, it's called Run GMP. Um, my biggest regret is that I never saw Brownsville Station in concert. Anybody remember Brownsville Station? Yeah. Smoking in the boys room, yeah! I'll do my Eddie Cochran impression. Are you guys familiar with Eddie Cochran? Like late 50s, early 60s rockabilly? Well, I was thinking like if Eddie Cochran was around like the late 60s when all the, everybody was doing political material, it'd be like, like Here she comes, cross the street. Here comes that girl again. One of the cutest since I don't know when. She don't notice me when I pass. She goes with other guys from an out of my class. But that don't stop me from a thinking to myself. We live in a class of society. Something's gotta change. Do -do -do -do. You know, like Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, like, hey baby, I think a revolution's coming. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, well, my experiences aren't good enough to sing about, so I have to sing about you know, world issues. You know, like, uh, I got the blues because my girlfriend left me and uh, people were starving in the third world. So I think that um, 
like people in Boston. <laughs> yeah, like the expression Gesundheit, you know, it's like, uh, it means, it's like, it means a different thing, like whatever part of the country you're in, you know. Like in Boston, Gesundheit just means go die somewhere else. <laughs> That's a keeper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I split up with my girlfriend. Uh, well, actually, she says she broke up with me because um, she was afraid everything that, uh, everything that uh, she said would end up in one of my comedy routines. That's her side of the story. My side of the story is I broke up with her because she wasn't giving me any good material. Uh, yeah, that's another keeper. Another keeper. Definitely. All right. Uh, you got a roll, kid. Okay, I can get my second ballot version of uh, Convoy. Well, does, does anybody know the, the song Convoy by Stilly McCall? Yes. Okay, it's like, it's like, We was headed for bear on I-1-0, about a mile out of Shaky Town. Uh, 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 I can't remember any of the lyrics. Do you remember any of the lyrics to that song? We got a great big convoy. We got a great big convoy trucking through the night. Yeah, we got a great big convoy. Yeah. Say, Come on, join our convoy, ain't nothing gonna get in our way. Woo! I used to think it was, we're gonna roll this fucking convoy. I was like, that was really cool. I used to want to be a, um, a teacher, actually. This is true. Um, except, this is like, this little story is sort of like, give you an example of why I could never be a teacher. So there was this kid reading a comic book in class, and I went over to him, and I was supposed to, you know, like, tell him he's not supposed to do it. But instead, what I did is, like, I said, you know, it's actually not how to do it, right? Like, when I did that, I used to, like, hold the comic book behind this textbook, you know, so no one could see it. Uh, James Taylor, you know, Francis, James Taylor went to uh, McLean's for depression? Oh, yeah? Yeah, they didn't cure him, though. They, they, but they got him back on his feet so he could, he could make it depress the whole country. Um, oh, yeah, I was talking about New Englanders, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know. Like one thing, there's a lot of new age people around here, and they're like, new age people have this thing about like, oh, there's politics don't exist. It's like, oh, you know, politics aren't important, you know. It's like, there must have been like a lot of new age people back in Nazi Germany, like in the early days, you know, like, oh, you know, politics doesn't matter, who cares about the Nazis, you know. Like, let's just go to the cabaret, you know. Oh, uh, you know, the Nazis closed down the cabaret. Oh, well, let's, let's, well, let's go to the seance. Uh, the Nazis arrested the lady there was a seance. Oh, let's just dress up as women and walk down the street. Oh, what's the Yeah. And then there's the politically correct people. That, and their, their motto is basically, the, they're, they're like, their like main philosophy is, you know, don't joke about Hitler. That's like the single philosophy behind the politically correct people. But it's also the main philosophy behind Hitler. You know? Don't joke about me. <laughs> Any another, communists? That's another keeper. Thanks. Are there any communists here? Oh, uh, yeah, one. Just Lucille, one? Lucille Ball was a communist. Really? Yeah, she was a card carrying member. Wow. Her grandfather made her do it, though. She never went to any meetings. Her grandfather made her be a communist? Yeah. Well, communism made her, never made it here because anytime someone got famous enough, to be strong enough to be a leader of anything, they just got a really high paying job and got bought out, you know? So, uh, I don't know, war between rich and poor, war between smart and dumb. I was reading this guy Cocteau, John Cocteau, this French, this depressing French existentialist guy. And I got two quotes from him that, that might be, you might find interesting. One is, our age is academic and undereducated. Yeah. Our age is academic and undereducated. Everyone is a professor who knows nothing and is eager to teach it to everyone else. And the other is, the trouble started with the encyclopedists. Francis, you have to listen to this. I am listening, but uh, I'm sorry, I really interrupted. Well, it's just that, you know, okay, the trouble was started with the encyclopedists. They told everyone to think. As a result, stupidity thinks, something which had never been seen before. I don't know, I was thinking about like, the, the French existential, so like, they're like the beats with minus marijuana, you know, it's like, like the beats are like, you know, uh, the world stinks and everything's depressing, you know, drinking coffee, you know, the beats like, like the, the, the books came over here and the beach were like, hey, you know, the world sinks, everything's depressing. All right, yeah, <laughs> let's go to Mexico. I came with the perfect uh, comeback line for anything. Like anytime anyone says anything you don't like, just say, don't flatter yourself. You know? Hi, how you doing? Don't flatter yourself. 
Hey, uh, you missed the you missed the ball. I uh, don't play every day. Anything. I thought Hitler had a lot of good ideas. Well, let's hear one. What was one of Hitler's good ideas, Francis? Uh, two coats of paint. <laughs> yeah. You're supposed to say, "Don't flatter yourself." Wait a minute. I, uh, I'm not following you. There. Oh well. Uh, see, I'm in this mode where I can only talk about my jokes. I can't even say your mouth. Uh, how about what's up? Don't you hear when people say what's up? Yeah. Like you haven't seen someone in a year. Hey, what's up? Well, uh, the first, see, the first day after the last time I saw you, I uh, woke up, uh, took a shit, uh, killed a dog, ate a fly. And second day since I, after I last saw you, I uh, woke up, uh, took LSD, spent the day with Marilyn Monroe. And... <laughs> Actually, I'm in a good mood. I'm happy. I'm happier than an undercover cop at a Grateful Dead show. I'm happier than a pickpocket at Harvard Square on a Saturday afternoon in July. I saw a woman the other day at a party. Uh, so I walked up to her and I said, uh, I said, I've been watching you from across the room. I like the way you pick your nose. I admire a woman with determination. She didn't respond positively, though. I have left here is the thing about uh, the Bible, uh, biblical days. So this guy was telling me that um, supposedly in the biblical days people lived to be 900 years old. So I don't know, I was just thinking like, you know, it's like, you like have to move out of the house at 150. Or... You look like a 700 year old today. <laughs> yeah, it's like men reach their sexual peak at 250 and women reach at 600. Go see not, start going see not I was talking to this guy. Um, oh, of, and when you're golfing, you can shoot your age. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I was talking to this uh, Oh, yeah, like I think about how I'm always talking about how schizophrenics are so smart. Well, I kind of just proved my own theory today. I was, the schizophrenic guy sat next to me on the bus coming in here today. And, uh, so, I, you know, he was like talking to himself, so, so I was thinking, so like, you know, I just wanted to start a conversation, so I said, uh, I said, oh, you heard Dixon died, didn't you? So, he, so we were talking, and I said, I was thinking about it, trying to see if I could use that in like, my routine at all. And he goes, well, um, I don't know, uh, did you do anything bad? You, have to, you, have to, you can only make jokes about a person if you do something bad, right? You know, so it's like, well, I was thinking, like, you know, well, maybe he hasn't done anything bad lately, you know? And he goes, well, I don't know anything about him, really. Like this guy knows, knows nothing at all about Nixon. I know he was president, but not all. So, so much for my theory that schizophrenics are smart. Just the ones that can spell schizophrenic. Well, well, Steve, I believe I went over my. Uh... You could probably tell you what, what the weather was in Budapest. Let me do. Let me finish with my with my Paul Pothead. This is Paul Pothead. Hey man, uh, this is a year zero. <laughs> oh, it's a year infinity, yeah. <laughs> hey, those glasses are you wearing. Thank you. Now I can't go on until they can stop killing seals. Okay, they stopped. There she was, just walking down the trail singing. <laughs> What's that, a Siberian folk group? <laughs> no, it's a big hit. Who you a With on. No. Seal bone hongo. Uh, yeah, well, now, um, Brian Melvin was saying, Hey, why do you smoke lights? Why don't you smoke the regular ones? Ah, but Brian, when you get to be my advanced stage, you realize you can control the dosage with the lights. You can, like, wrap your lips around those little holes that they put in the filter and get a real good hit. Or you can be a lady and go, ah, yes. Yes, so good. Whereas with the Marlboros, you know, the regular straights, it's like, shh, it's all your long time. Yes, sir. Ah. You know, so, I mean, that's why. The ultralights, so I won't go for that, you know? It's like, you know, smoking those menthol ultralights, it's like sucking peppermint candy through a carbon monoxide filter, you know? It's like, yeah, who needs that, you know? Who's that for, anyway? It's like, I'm trying to quit.
know. Well, you know, do the camel straights, man. You'll have to quit, you know. Yeah, here comes Brian. He's going to add to this little commentary. I got a rebuttal. <laughs> no, the fact, the reason why I even brought it up, Francis, is because he smokes ultralight 100s, which is sort of an oxymoron. You know, see, me, I don't like the full rounds. I just smoke regular Marlboros. Ultra light 100, so you smoke more of a light cigarette, They're like light. somehow you're going to get less nicotine out of smoking an ultra light 100. It's not an ultra light, it's just a light. Oh, light, I'm sorry. Yes. I suppose you put speed into caffeinated coffee. Well, um, no, 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 the whole point is, you, know I mean? you, you get more, you get more of that less that you're wanting, you know? It's like putting a super engine into uh, a Volkswagen, it just doesn't make sense. You're one of those guys who, when he bums a cigarette, he tears the filter off, right? Yeah, and, and then, I'll tell you, then I eat it. Yeah, five years from now, man, you're going to be on Skid Row. Hey, man, can I can have a cigarette. Oh, not this kind. You know, it's like, you know, that's what I hate. Bums who are choosy about the cigarettes. I'm this not is, choosy. This is a Cambridge. I can pick these up off the ground. Yeah. You know? hey, let me tell you something. The, the butts you find outside in Cambridge are some of the nicest, the best tasting cigarette butts you can find anyway. That's true, you know, because you know, all these women wearing patchouli smoke them, so you get a whiff of whatever it is they're wearing on your, on your, uh, <laughs> little dab here, a little dab there. The folds in their neck? I actually found some pot leaves on the ground in Cambridge once. Oh, yeah. Only in Cambridge. They were they fresh, were too. Real fresh. No. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what they do in Cambridge? When they go to, like, a fancy Thai restaurant, they leave their half-eaten meal next to a mailbox so some bum can pick it up. I'll tell you, we got the best fed homeless people in the country. Yeah, it's true. They're overweight. They're what? They're overweight. That's right. America is the only country in the world in which homeless are overweight. They yeah. diet soda. They got bank cards. <laughs> I saw a homeless guy using a bank card at a teller machine. That's, that's not that's homeless. Just, that's just so they can stay in there. That's because he lives there. Yeah. That's just so they can go in there and pull day. Why not for a minute? You know, live in one of those bank cashing things because yeah. what the fuck? I want to be next to my money at all times. It's like sleeping with the money in your bathroom. Hey, they don't have to pay taxes. Hey, I think we They got keep the streets clean so they can sleep there. We've got the making of a new format here. Three comics on stage at once. Yeah, um, it's, because, it's because it's so hard to have a conversation in New England. This is the only way you can talk to people. Well, but you know something? I think maybe we'd better, uh, the microphone or really uh, uh, we better, we better uh, bring on the next guy because, uh, He's been awaiting and he came all the way from, where was it, Worcester? Uh, Hudson. Uh, it sounds like like one of Bruce Wayne's friends, you know. Hi, my name is Hudson, Mr. Hudson. But you can call me Hawk, Hawk Hudson, you know. But why do they call you that? Because my first words as a baby were, <laughs> you know. So, anyway, uh, anyhow, yes, yeah, so, <clears throat> Mr. Ed Hogan. Let's hear it for him, Mr. Ed Hogan. springtime today since all that goddamn snow is finally gone, the sand's starting to disappear. One of the things that uh, I enjoy about the spring is that the, the animals start to become a little more active, the birds return, and uh, I was just getting into this conversation the other day, we were talking about, and, and Brian had alluded to this earlier, about pets being neutered and declawed and so forth, and I got to thinking, you know, if a woman has to have a hysterectomy, or a guy gets, has a cancerous testicle or something, we aid them with hormone supplements. What the fuck do we do for dogs and cats? Nothing. Now here it is springtime, somebody probably just got their, you know, their dog deballed or something. He's, oh, it's getting warm up. <laughs> He's running around and, uh, I ain't got nothing down there. You know, they start scratching around like kibbles and bitch. You know, where's my nuts? Where's my nuts? What? Hey, those aren't my nuts. Uh, what the fuck do they do? We, you know, maybe we ought to start putting testosterone and estrogen in dog food and, and cat food to help them out. Because, I, I mean, it's got to be a pretty bizarre existence, you know, you go down there, I can't even give myself a blowjob anymore. You know, like they lick themselves and keep themselves clean. That's another thing I, about the spring that, and this is really the, the main piece here, is, is birds. I mean, just fascinating, I find them fascinating, I mean, and who amongst us 
you're hanging around the yard, the beach, whatever, just lazing out on a nice spring or summer day, and birds just floating around, going anywhere they want, anytime they want. I mean, who wouldn't want to have that ability? And I got to thinking that in some cases it would come in pretty handy. For example, I don't know if any of you have ever noticed this, but on the way to Logan Airport, just before you get into the tunnel, there's a sign that says, danger, high voltage. And that's just where I want to be when I'm in a van loaded with people and luggage about 60 feet underwater where there's high voltage. Now, if I was a bird, I could just haul my ass out of there. Well, and I wouldn't even have to be worrying about going to the airport because if I wanted to go to LA, I'd just pick myself off the ground and fly to LA. Another instance where being a bird would come, being, uh, would come in useful is in the summer when you're on your way home from the Cape for the weekend. I don't know about you, but it always seems to happen. I get to about Norwell, and I finally can't hold the leak back that I've been holding in since I left the Cape. I don't know why I didn't leave. I didn't know why I didn't go before I left. And obviously, previous to towns like Norwell, the, the woods are fairly thick, could have pulled over, went no problem. But now that the traffic's bogging down, now that every pebble translates all the way to your bladder, you finally have to go. So you pull over, you hop out of the car, and it looks like a, a promising stand of trees. You go in about six feet, you grab your fly, and it's a Sunday afternoon cookout at the Jones's house. So you gotta hightail it and go someplace else. Now if you're a bird, you're just flying around, you're on your way home from the cave, boom, lift up a wing, you've had it. You don't have to worry about this shit. On the downside of being a bird, I've often wondered how they deal with, with their residents. I mean, every year it's the same old fucking deal. They're hanging around in September, the nights start getting a little colder and they can't stand it anymore. So they're like, ah, Jesus, I gotta haul off and fly 3,000 miles down to South America again. Christ almighty, I just got this house finished. And then they come back in the spring and where's their home? That home that they spent three months building the year before. I mean, I, I swear that's why we, we see so many of them flying around in the spring kind of aimlessly is because they can't find their house. So they got to fly 3,000 miles all the way back from South America. I get here, I get no fucking place to live. I got to fly from yard to yard, picking up twigs, and then I'm just going to get that last twig in place for the living room where I can put the lamp, and it's going to get cold, and I got to fly back down to South America again. And uh, that's about all I had for today. I was just trying, to, uh, just trying to. Usually, when I do something, I rehearse it, and I hadn't rehearsed this at all. So I was just trying to see how that went. Hey, don't explain. Okay. No. Hey, I got one more joke. Oh, okay. One more joke. One, three, four, five. That was about five minutes. Oh, I mean, Mr. Ed Hogan with his standard five-minute set, which is actually, uh, you know, it's cool, man. We like that. Yeah. Here at Comedy on the Edge of the Middle East, and now Mr. Steve Iskowitz has something he wishes to say. Yeah, my leftover joke. It's a folk song. It goes like this. You take a stick of bamboo, you take a stick of bamboo, you take a stick of bamboo, you smash your older sister's Pete Seeger record with it. Uh, Wait a minute, that was Dave Van Ronk, though. Yeah, yeah, come on no, up. No, this is, this was a plan. We were talking about him to take hip-hop. Remember the old three stooges kid with Marlon? Even driving, 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 that was their way of being politically correct at the Jewish time. Jewish people are the only people who can really make fun of Hitler at all. Well, that's not true. What about Germans? Hey, come on. No, Ger but Germans are afraid of Jewish. What is Hitler Jewish backwards? people are like the least, least inhibited, because they can say, they don't have to worry about offending anyone. Uh, I, am, like really I am the dictator of Relti. We're going to bring six million back to life. And, um, well, we'll do it backwards. Where are you going, Jeff? Just go over here. Okay, well, we got our next comic up, and he's also from the 508 area code, which could be Hudson, or it could be uh, North Adams, for all I know. Where are you from, Kevin? Uh, Bill Ricca now. Bill Ricca. Bill. Hi, I'm an old cow hand. My name's Bill Ricca. Yeah, I see you. 
Well, all right. Well, let's have it. Let's hear it. Let's have it. Let's give it up. Let's do the thing. Let's clap and be, be merry for Mr. Kevin Cotter. <laughs> Hi, uh, it's nice to be back here again. It's a wonderful day out there. It's Earth Day. Everybody's having a wonderful Earth Day. Um, I know there's a lot going on in Cambridge and a lot going on in Boston, so it's probably tourist day for Earth Day. And if, if you are a tourist, I just want to take this moment to welcome you to Earth. It's a wonderful planet, and um, we're here on the third stone from the sun. We'd like to visit your planet when you have your day. Um, like I said, it's good, it's good weather today. You know, I just moved. I'm out, like I said, in Bella Rick, or out in the suburbs. I used to live out in the, out in the boondocks, out in the sticks. Well, actually, it was, um, what they called it on the brochure was a secure facility in a wooded setting. But I moved out of there, and now I'm up in the suburbs. You know, it's different. I'll tell you, they, um, on the weekends, they get busy, stay busy. I got up Saturday last week, and, um, I'm used to getting up and there's nothing going on. It didn't look like somebody kicked over an anthill. There were busy people everywhere. People were mowing and raking and hedge trimming and roto killing, wheelbarrowing. And my favorite one, they were leaf blowing. That's a strange one. I gotta tell you, if, it's, if I had to make up a derogatory term for a white person, it would be a leaf blower. Hey, I saw your mama with a leaf blower last night. But, um, oh, excuse me. But it, it, I just don't understand it. It's, leaves get blown all over a yard. And this clown would buy a leaf blower and blow them off to the back of the yard. Uh, doesn't he, what's he think? A wind strong enough to blow a leaf is like an ecological phenomenon? It'll never happen again? Kind of like Mount St. Helens? I don't think so. I think it's just gonna get blown again. But some of the people, you know, they, they wise, they're a little smarter than that. They, they get the wheelbarrow. And they, um, they fill it up with the leaves and the sticks and the stones, and they dump it all in the back of the leaf blower's yard. Let him deal with it. But that's, a, that's another weird thing I noticed, too, though. The wheelbarrow? Anybody ever use one of those things lately? It's, it's like all it wants to do is tip over to the left, tip over to the right. And um, it was, what was it built? Like the 12th century? Isn't it about due for an upgrade? I, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe Mr. Pompeo will catch on or something. I was thinking, uh, you know, I'm no genius myself, but how about maybe two wheels on the front? I know those of you that live in castles with narrow parapets, you know, might find this a little hard to cope with at first, but try to deal with it. It'll probably change back in another seven, eight centuries. Um, what else is new? Um, I got my new sneakers on again. There's a little consumer tip. If you're looking to buy new sneakers, forget about what all those guys in the NBA wear. They're paid by shoe companies. If they pay them enough money, they wear fish on their feet. When I want to get new sneakers, I go down to Out of Town News and I go to the, um, the magazine section that has those lusty magazines, and I find one of the nudist colonies because that's their entire wardrobe, two sneakers. You know they've got to be comfortable and good. You want to be wearing the best when somebody comes up to you and says you have a nice pair. Um, oh yeah, um, I took the train here again because I'm having some car trouble, which is like the story of my life. I'm like the, the Dr. Kevorkian of cars. When cars want to die, they search me out. And then, you know, I have them for a little while and they hopefully they die peacefully. Right now, I'm driving an 18 year old Buick station wagon with a bad exhaust and a body rock. The good part is, if a girl gets in my car, I know it's not just because I have a flashy car, it's because she has a mean pimp and I have $20. Um, oh, yeah, speaking of uh, pimps, I know one person that will never need a pimp again. Anybody see the story in the Globe? I think it was Tuesday, the guy was in prison in New Hampshire, cut off his own penis while in jail. Yeah, yeah, it really happened. It was on, um, like I said, it was in the Globe. It was on page 15. 
Can you imagine that? You, you cut your own penis off and they bury the story on page 15? I mean, somebody sucker punched Bonnie the other day and they got page one. But anyway, the, the story, there were other parts of it because it gets a little sicker. He cut it off with a prison issue razor blade. Like, why they gave this guy a razor blade? I mean, you're supposed to look sharp while you're in prison? I don't know. But then he, he went, and this is true, he went to Bible class right after he cut it off and sat there for an hour. Calmly. I mean, I cut my finger and I have to tell everybody, people I don't even know are going to find out about it. Um, other, other prison news. The governor, Billy Well, everybody, he's trying to push this um, boot camp thing again. It was just in the paper that it doesn't work. People go out and they go right back again. You know, I'm thinking about it. Obviously, the governor has never been to boot camp. I have. I mean, he expects people to go there and they come out and be stable members of society. After going through two or three months of, of boot camp, harassment, terrorism, the last thing I wanted to do was like, oh, I'm out of boot camp now. I think I'll register the vote and go to church. You know, I wanted whiskey, and I wanted to get laid, and I wanted to get a bike, and a tattoo, you know, and then maybe, you know, go to church and help out the community. I don't know. He, he's just, he doesn't have a clue in that department. Um, the last thing I have is, uh, oh yeah, the news. I, can, I, I read the paper, I can't watch the news on TV anymore. It's, uh, it's too predictable. I was walking by the TV the other day, and, and I hear the middle of it. And in Boston, a homeless veteran with a history of mental illness and an extensive, extensive weapons collection. And, and that's it. The only reason I could stop is if I wanted to hear a body count. It's just too predictable. They should mix it up once in a while. You know, like, um, you know, in Brighton, a woman with two infant children who lived in an apartment that fire department officials said did not have smoke detectors suddenly realized she was a fucking idiot and moved to a better apartment. You know, they should throw it off a little bit. <clears throat> um, no, I think that's about all I have for this week. Um, enjoy your Earth Day. Welcome to Australia. Kevin Carter. Carter. Well, that ends this segment of Comedy on the Edge, although we will be doing another segment in a very short while. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope to see you next time. My name is Francis Tomeno. Thank you to Brian Melvin, Kevin Carter, Steve Iskowitz, and Ed Hogan. Gentlemen, direct from his successful engagement at several local comedy clubs, Mr. Brian Melvin, here on Comedy on the Edge. Hey, Doc. Oh, well, pretty good, you know, uh, you know. This is almost a mockery to comedy, I tell you. Well, tell us about your, uh, your recent performance. Well, all right. I'm going to have to tell you, I'm not telling you how, how much I hate other comedians. Like, I, I, went in, I went in and I did uh, an extra like five minutes or ten minutes. And this chick was cool, you know, like she was hosting it. She was sort of doing me a favor, letting me get up there. And of course, I did, I, well not of course, but I did, I did reason, reasonably well. And of course she gets pissed off about it. You know what I mean? Like the crowd was asleep when I got on. And then seriously, after I got off, they were like, you know, I may not necessarily say they were laughing, but they were at least, they were at least, yeah, man. <laughs> I'm the unknown comic. <laughs> hey, can I play with you guys today? 
granting it to you in tiny little parcels and dollops and hoping that perhaps some of it will rub off on you. As you can see, I've been very fortunate in my career. I'm not crippled, I'm not deaf, I'm not blind. I may have lost several hundred thousand brain cells in the last 13 years, but it doesn't really matter much because when you get old, everybody expects that anyway and nobody notices. Excuse me, sir, do you walk down the street whistling Stephen Sondheim? No? Neither, neither do I. I don't even know who Stephen Sondheim is. So, anyway, I just thought I'd get that in. And you, sir, with the striped shirt. That's very nice. Where do you purchase an item of apparel like that? Is it a specialty store or is it just a department store? You know, you can ask the most insolent questions in the world if you just preface it with sir. It's like, uh, sir, you know? <laughs> it's like, uh, sir, are you up there on the cross for fun or are they crucifying you? Uh, sir, how come you get all the vinegar sponges and nobody else does, huh? You know? Like, you can just do just buy anything. Sir, what are you doing here? Oh, this is your Ray agent. No, this is Harry Hamburger. Hey, <laughs> Cecil. Good to see you. I'm not going to clean the mess on the stage. I'm going to leave it there. You're going to leave it. Brad is done all the time. You're a real sport. I'm a real sport. You better start singing today. Cecil, yes. hey, let me take some. I'll clean this up. Are you going to let me clean up? Well, this is the end. Okay, the end. Finney, 30, else. goodbye, yeah? farewell, arriba dirce, bon voyage, aloha, which means goodbye as well as hello in Hawaiian. Um, um, like later, catch you on the flip side, yeah, you know. It used to be like a famous ad about Marshall Brady getting hit with a football in the nose, and then my taste went downhill from there. And now it's like Roseanne, Oprah, and then I was watching the Muppets the other day and thinking, you know, Miss Piggy really isn't that bad looking. And I'm telling you, because if she ever pissed you off, you could eat her for breakfast, and no one could say a freaking thing. Imagine that sleeping with a pig, and I'm not even from Arkansas. <laughs> I said that in Maine, I go, and I'm not even from Arkansas, and everyone goes, ooh. They go, what are you, shit, me? I was going to say Maine. I didn't want to get my ass kicked. <laughs> it's the truth, though. Oh, what else can I bore you with? My sex life. How bad is it? I fake orgasm. This is when I'm alone. I got to convince my hand that someone else is dead just to play with myself, and then it falls asleep. Yeah, things are pretty bad. The Red, so Red Sox are, uh, well, they just lost their losing streak, but into that, but, um, Hey, you know what? What's that? My girlfriend said to me today, uh, no sex. And I said, um, why, are you off the pill? She said, yes. And I said, well, no love. <laughs> <laughs> no love. Uh, no sex, no love. Oh, yeah, I think you said about that. That thing you said about Maine, it reminds me of this, something, something I just read, uh, this guy in West Virginia. He said, don't mess around with those hillbillies, because they'll take whatever you give them, they'll throw it right back in your face. Like one time there was this boy, and he was fishing in the creek, and a stranger comes up to him, a city slicker, and he says, boy, how long is it up about a mile up from this creek? How far is it? And the boy looks at him and says, well, I reckon it's about five times as long as a pool, so lay down and start measuring, stranger. <laughs> yeah, about that guy that uh, lopped, lopped his thing off the prison. Now, apparently it doesn't, it's not big news because it happens so often these days. I suppose you didn't hear about the big penis massacre in Beirut last week. Now, I'm sure if it would happen to a German Shepherd, you sure as hell would hear about it. What? I'm sure as hell if it, if it happened to a German Shepherd, you'd hear about it. There you go! I'm telling you, Francis. It'd be in the news. Today, 40 million people die in an earthquake. But first, a sad note. The Wilson's dog, Fluffy, got his penis tragically lopped off in a freak lawnmower accident. Yeah, that, that's just the way, that's just the way. Goddamn country. What the hell's wrong with this country? Uh, it's like uh, 80,000 people die in India today of an earthquake. <laughs> combined with massive fires which blew up most of Calcutta, 110,000 people are also expected to be casualties in this tragedy. And now look at the local news. A German shepherd. Yeah, no, 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 Francis. First, 
on a sad note. <laughs> <laughs> now, a sad note. Yeah, right. I'm telling you. That's what they say, you know, 10,000 die in India, 5,000 die in Europe, 3,000 die in New York, one person wins the spelling bee in Boston, and it's all like, well, what do we lead with? No, no, no. The spelling bee. No, you know what, it's, it's like, you have to equal it out to Americans. See, American lives are worth more than other lives. I'd say one American is about, oh, 500 foreigners. It's all, it all depends, you know, everything's relative, you know, uh, you know, like, Bosnia, you know, that, they're European, so that's that's maybe like forty to one. Yeah, forty to one, you know. But you go to like Ethiopia, that's like a million. You know? A million to one. A million. Um, well, actually, three million people are at risk in Ethiopia. Yeah, yeah, and you know, uh, I just figured something out. Somalia has oil. Bosnia doesn't. Two plus two equals five. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that amazing? And Bill Clinton is waffling again. I tell you, he should be a bre breakfast chef. Goddamn Clinton. You should eat waffle fries. What's that? Waffle fries? Yeah, they have this. Uh, yeah, they have this place down in Harvard Square called Palmas Fritas, and uh, try the satay sauce. It's really good. It's fat, you know, it's fattening as hell. It's like peanut sauce, basically. Potatoes and peanut sauce. What is? What am I, George Washington Carver here? But uh, it's a good place, and they have these things called waffle fries. Now here's what everybody walks in here at 1 o'clock, they ask them, what's the fastest thing you have on your menu? And they always say the same thing, the waffle fries. They only take mm -hmm. a minute, and then you're five minutes later, oh, here's your waffle fries. I wanted those to go. Oh, okay, well, I'll just put them in here. Okay. The fastest thing on their menu is the little bugs scamping around in your plate. Are they good? Well, they, they, put, <laughs> they, they have the roaches there, so the place will feel like home. Yeah, right. Not at not Palmas Fritas. It's a very clean oh, home, yeah, place. Yeah. It's in a basement. They don't have roaches. They have rats. No, just kidding. <laughs> Good place, but $2.50 for a small order of fries? Get real. The sauce is worth maybe 50 cents. You can make it at home for 49 cents, you know. But uh, the fries? Potatoes cost like 8 cents a pound or something, and they charge two fifty for them? Get real. I mean, their profit margin, they'll be going, they'll be buying Kuwait next year with that kind of thing. <laughs> you know, Kuwait is just Switzerland with air conditioning and slaves. Figure it out. Yeah, that's all it is. Women can't drive. More, more money. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, maybe that's why we went in here. Women can't drive. We'll teach those uppity women. They might have changed that by now, but I doubt it. Switzerland. Oh, Home of the Rolex. What about this place you were working at for a year? Which place? Don't give any names. When you okay. went, when you went corporate. What? Oh, uh, first, first and oh, I can't say it. I'll say it anyways. First investors, biggest scam, pyramids. <laughs> oh, it's a pyramid scam, and they are really suck in because they say Wall Street Investment Company. You know, you get your card and it says district manager and everything, but boy, they suck in. But good. So the idea of it is you, you develop a list, you go to your re friends, relatives, and family, and you suck them in, and then when they lose money, you, not only are you broke, but no one likes you either. And that's hell. Uh, it was awful. It was awful. Well, how, long, how long were you there? Uh, about nine months or so. Nine months, time to be born again. I was just going to say that. <laughs> Well, it was worse than, the whole thing was like labor pains, you know? <laughs> unlike a regular birth, the pain the was consistently through the nine months. Yeah, the labor pains lasted nine months. Mm -hmm. But anyways, let me get back to this guy. So you didn't hear about this guy who chopped this thing off? Well, let me tell you about it. So come, children, gather around the Christmas tree. Uncle Brian's got a little story. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was thinking this guy, after, uh, there was a prisoner, and I was thinking this guy, he was distraught about something, I don't know, maybe having a penis, who knows. So he, he cut her off, and I'm thinking, boy, what a tough son of a bitch this guy must be. You know, imagine getting in a fight with him. Hey, buddy, I know six forms of Taekwondo, and I can bench press a truck. The guy would be like, oh, uh, yeah? I cut my dick off. What do you say to that? So? So what? Then I ate it. <laughs> well, you didn't eat it. You flushed it. And then the big tough con goes up and says, I'm tired of being the boss. 
why don't you be the boss for a while, huh? Yeah. That was a big thing, that, like AIDS in prison, like people getting raped and shit. Hey, you know, did you hear about that? Governor Weld said that he's going to stop this like uh, sexual molestation stuff in prison. And you know what? Right on the same page was, um, you know, the people, the white supremacists, if they march in Southie, they'll go to jail, you know? Or they might go to jail. So I, I was thinking, Governor Weld, well, um, they're going to do civil disobedience and we're going to have to throw them in jail, but let's make it easy on them. We'll, get rid we'll have a moratorium on prison rape for a while. Yeah. A moratorium? Yeah. Well, what do you mean a moratorium? We're having a two-week... Um, uh, uh, seminar? Uh, no, no, an abstinence, you know. Oh, really? Well, we're, we're, no, yeah, you're right, it's a seminar, I'm using it wrong. Rectify the language, said Confucius. We're, we're having a um, uh, two-week ration on prison sex, um, only in the shower, only if somebody bends over to pick up the soap. Otherwise, no sex in prison. Can you imagine that? What, what better way to make these uneducated, uh, you know, totally dysfunctional, drug-addicted people even more angry? Oh, now they're trying to stop weightlifting. Did you hear about that? Yeah, yeah. Let's just suck the strength out of them. Yeah, right, right. Oh, yeah. We're, we're going to teach them how to play chess. <laughs> you know what I mean? That would be good, you know? Um, or, or at least go, you know? They could they have something in common with Japanese people who will be running this country in 40 years, if not the Chinese. Yeah, they're, they're talking about the Japanese. Five years ago, it was like Japan number one, United States number two. You don't hear much about that anymore. But start thinking about China number one. Start thinking about China taking us off their most favored nation. Well, Francis, like Monopoly games, if you ever played the Singapore version of Monopoly, there's no get out of jail free. <laughs> America, there's an excess of it. <laughs> there's about five different spots that you can choose where it says get get out of jail free. Yeah, every other square on the board is get out of jail free. Yeah. You ever play Monopoly with your friends and they land on your hotel and they say, oh, come on, let it go just this once. It's like, hey, come That's on. Let it go. The okay. object of the game, you know, we only play this until the year 2003, you know? Get real. Pay me. Pay me. Uh, I'll just borrow the money from the bank. The hell you will. Pay me. Right. Sell your hotels. I don't care. I don't care what you do. Not in America, boy. When you play when you play games with your friends, it's always the rules are just a little less strict. It's like Scrabble. Can I look a word up? No. The rules prohibit looking words up in the dictionary. Uh, I don't think so. There, well, there's a Scrabble dictionary. No, you can't look it up. Um, what what you what you have to do if you're really playing tournament Scrabble. You gotta, if someone puts down a word, it isn't a word, and you challenge it, oh, and you lose it is a if word, it's not. if it's a word, you lose your turn, if it's not a word, they lose their turn. Oh, so you're not supposed to look words up, but, you know, you know, you're playing with your girlfriend, what are you going to say? No, you can't. All right. No sex. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so what, what can you say? So the rules get bent out of shape. Um, um, well, Francis, if you're playing Scrabble instead of having sex, I'm sure it's not a big priority in your life. No. For me, at this age, playing Scrabble is foreplay, Brian. Okay? Uh, like, if she says something like, can I uh, put the word, um, um, you know, like... Um, Loquacious. Havings. What do you mean? Having is a, a gerund. It doesn't take a plural. Yeah, but if you had two words, right? Loquacious. Like, one of them was having, and the other one was having, you'd have havings. Two having. So, okay, okay, put an S on anything. Uh. Okay, well, today on this segment of comedy at the Middle East, we're going to play Stump the English Major with Francis. Uh, Francis, loquacious. Talkative. Lobiquious. All-encompassing, all around. Uh, omnipresent. All, Same all thing. present. Uh, Omnicompetent, all competent. Probiscus. Nose. Uh, Eight nose. Um, that's what happens when you snort too much coke. Uh, let's see, what's another good word that I know? Um, you know lots of good words. Uh, let's see, what was it? Juxtapost. Put next to. Yeah. Use it as sentence. Uh, Brian said was juxtaposed next to mine in this opening segment of Comedy on the Edge for today. Let's see, what other good words? Brian didn't mind. I don't know any other good words. Sure you do. The. <laughs> uh, well, it's a, um, it's a definite article, as opposed to the somewhat less than committed articles that we find elsewhere, like the. Yeah, but that's just describing what uh, type of word it is. That's not actually a definition. It's the hardest word to describe. The? Well, Steve, whip up some good words. Do you know any good words? 
sure he does. Come on, give it a shot. Come on, sucker, give it your best shot. That reminds me of, while you're thinking, I'll tell you this anecdote. My girlfriend, um, when I sort of dropped out of society for six years, she uh, was going out with this, you know, loser. Um, of course he's a loser. She wasn't going out with a fucking stockbroker. She, she was going out with this ex-jailbird, and he was on probation and all this shit. And so we had a little confrontation in her apartment at about three in the morning. And he says to me, you know, you want to fight? You want to fight? And I said, yeah, I challenge you to a duel. And since I challenged you, I get to pick the weapons. Spelling. You lose. Who was he? So you would have lost. I mean, you would have lost. He lost. Right, right. I picked the weapons. He lost. Um, he was on probation, so he didn't kick my ass. <laughs> I was going to throw a typewriter at his head. That's how mad I was. Talk about the pen being mighty. Hit him off the head with the dictionary. He got my package of cigarettes and sliced it up with one of those ninja stars. <laughs> you know, whoa, I don't care if you hit me, but stay the fuck away from my smokes, man. <laughs> yeah, that's too much. Really? Crazy times, crazy times. And now it's time to play sports trivia with Stump Bryant. Okay. In what year did the Red Sox nearly win the pennant? Uh, 76. Between whose legs was that fatal ball allowed Bill to roll? Bill dropped the ball, Buckner. And who hit the ball that Bill dropped? Uh, Gary Carter? Mookie Wilson. Was it? I believe so. I, I don't think know. Gary Carter got walked or something. Yeah. Boy, I hated that bastard. I'll bet. All right. Um, in the 1972 World Series between Pittsburgh and Baltimore, who hit the ball that almost gave Baltimore a home run and won them the pennant? Pittsburgh and Baltimore? I don't know. Boog Powell. Who? Boog Powell. Do some boxing. I know a lot about boxing. Oh, oh great. Um, geez. Um, how many times was Muhammad Ali heavyweight champion? Uh, four. Who did he lose to the last time he lost? Uh, the, la the last fight he lost or the yeah. last championship? Last oh, championship. Um, let's see. It wasn't Spinks. Oh, uh, wait, wait, wait. Let me think. Uh, Larry Holmes. Larry Holmes. All right. Hey, you should start a housing project called Larry Holmes. Uh, <laughs> only, only boxers are allowed to live there. Larry Holmes. Hey, we're here to, we're here to tell you that I'm an important businessman now. You know the way boxing the way isn't my sport anymore. Did you see the Evander Holyfield fight? No. I thought it was a goddamn mess. The guy was getting a shit kicked out of him. I guess he's a real religious person. Uh -huh. And in in his corner, they kept saying, "The Lord is with you, Evander. The Lord is with you." It's like he doesn't need a Lord. He needs a baseball bat. He needs a lawyer. I was waiting for the Pope to come up and give him the Eucharist. Okay, Evander. Vanity, you're a sinner. Now go out and beat the crap out of that guy. How did you win? How did you win? I had a St. Christopher's medal. Oh, uh, then it lets you win? Yeah, I had it in my glove. It weighs three pounds, you know. Boom. So what are the box? No, any other boxing channels? Oh, I love them. boxing. Boxing's my favorite because, you know, two half-naked brutes covered with sweat and the blood of their opponent beating the guitar out of each other. Man, that's my idea of sportsmanship, hey. I'm telling you. And you know something else? Like that guy who got sent to jail um, for... Uh, for having non-consensual sex with Miss Rhode Island? Mike Tyson. Oh yeah, right, right, right. Now, what were they thinking when they introduced Mike Tyson to Miss Rhode Island? Hi, champ, I know you're covered with the blood of the man you just beat to death, but I'd like you to meet a very special friend right, of mine, right. Miss Rhode Island. Oh, so glad you hit the Chris. Robin Givens, what happened to her? She gave the money back. No. Right? Her name shouldn't be Robin Givens, it should be Robin Takens. Right? No, but no, she, she gave the money back. She didn't take the money. And if she had taken it... She it, didn't? That's bullshit. She didn't. She, Honest to God, she didn't. And now it's the only thing you can say about I've her. never heard that, Francis. She said she wasn't going to take keep the money. Uh, all right, Francis, all right, all right. please. Okay. That's what she said. Come on. You think she married Mike Tyson for his freaking intelligence? He's a girl that went to goddamn Radcliffe. She did? She went to Radcliffe. She was like a pre-law student or something, a law student. Let me tell you, she's a brilliant girl, and she went out with Mike Tyson, the biggest Neanderthal. You know what I mean? Hey, opposites attract, man. Of course, being uh, a man and a woman boys, is opposite enough, but... Boy, she raked him over the leaf. But <laughs> no, no, she tied him to her bumper and drove him off a cliff and then ran him over. Let me tell you something about Robin Givens. I tell you, oh, that pisses me off. Where's her, where's her brother, Batman Givens? 
Robin Givens. They had to have the Batman be, movie. Her name should be Robert Givens. Robin Takens. Robert Baron Givens. But I understand Mike Tyson is uh, doing a lot of reading in prison, and uh, he's, he's actually uh, studying acting. Yep, he is. He's going to be on Broadway when he gets out. I can see him doing Romeo and Juliet. It'll probably go something like this. Basketball Jones, Mike. Uh, Basketball Mike. Jones! No, it'd be like Michael Jackson. Uh, Mr. Tyson, could you please turn down your radio a little bit? Bend over! <laughs> I guess Mike Jackson could be Shem, you know? The stooge that didn't quite make it. Just like Zeppo, the Marx brother who didn't quite make it, you know? <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. You get Whatever happened to the fag one, Joe? <laughs> Stop it. Well, What's up know, with that dude? Joe Dorita? Well, they brought him in after Curly and Chef died, you know? And, uh, Is that true? I yeah. thought he was the first one before no, that. No, Here's the chronology. Shemp was with them first, and then uh, Curly decided to join after Shemp quit, and then Curly died, and they had this guy for a while, uh, Curly Joe. Yeah, who, right, right. But that, that wasn't Joe Dorita. And, and then Shemp came back, and then Shemp died, and so then they got Joe Dorita, who was by far the least inspired of any person who pretended to be a stooge. The only good stooges are the ones with Curly. The Shemps are okay. Right, right. They're passable. They're, they're the ones good. with Curly, uh, you know. They're, the, they're stellar. And you know what? The thing is, it's genius comedy. If you people think, about think it. that's so easy, but they were practicing that stuff for like at least 10 years to get every single move down perfect. Even the Three Stooges <laughs> takes the concentration of a supreme artist. Just imagine what something really artistic takes to develop to its fullest extent. And you know, early movies were better because a lot of them were stage plays and a lot of the actors had time to work out the business over a course of years and over, you know, touring with different audiences. Mass communications killed craftsmanship in acting because you have a TV sitcom, you rehearse it once, boom, that's right, it. Right. Do the blocking, dress rehearsal, mm -hmm. now it's time to shoot. Three cameras, camera A, camera B, camera C. Give us a smile on camera C, Michael J. Fox. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So it killed it killed the artistic part of acting. Is that well, it didn't it? kill it, but it sort of diminished it. I mean, Damn, if right you're it doing did. something ten thousand times to doing it once, well, you got that spontaneity, but spontaneity is very overvalued when it comes to making something of lasting appeal. Damn, you know? Right. 
fun movies? Yeah, yeah, they do, like 15 yeah, but or 26. Let me, let me tell you something. I haven't been to a good movie in years. You know, I, it, it just, they bore me. Because the only good movie I've seen was a, like a, like a, it was like this obscure cult film from, from, from Canada. And what it was is just some nobodies, you know, who, who you know, have probably been act, acting since they were kids. But now they get these nimrods who got the look. And they come out there and they can't act, and they get like Bruce Willis's and Don Johnson's who don't know their asses from their elbows, and it just takes away from the movie, even if it's a good script. Like, for example, uh, in A Few Good Men, like Demi Moore. She, I said this to a woman at work, and she freaked out on me, but she had these breast implants. Just, they just look, uh, they, don't look pro they don't look proper. They, they just, she, she sort of looks like she's deformed. And, and here she is supposed to be in a part that you're supposed to believe and say, oh, that could happen. It just takes away from it. So I give it two thumbs up. <laughs> I'm not a freaking movie critic. Who am I kidding? What was that stuff you were doing before? On what? At the very opening. Uh, Disneyland? No, before that. <clears throat> uh, the guy, the dog, the guy that's thing? The condom. Ah! <laughs> That's my son. I'm getting freaking weird. I've been living alone too long. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you what. I don't feel it. I'll do another. I need to tell you. Do you ever imaginary conversations when you live alone? Like walk around talking to an imaginary person? No, but I look tough in the mirror sometimes. <laughs> I do that. Instead of fighting someone, I get out, get out of the, the bathroom, I, I have a cigarette, and I, and I look tough. And I think about how tough I should be. You know what I'm saying? But uh, imaginary conversations. You know what I used to do is play cock a duty man. You ever play that? Like, I've been trying to, I've been trying to regress. I'm like, Brian, get a little, getting a little older, you're getting too serious. Huh. I never think that would happen. And I thought, you know, regress to your childhood. Start doing things. So we used to play cock a duty man where you take a stick and you wipe some dog shit on it and you wipe it on someone else and they're it. So, I played it at work and my boss wasn't too happy. <laughs> no, that's, that's kind of like the time I brought the basketball to the funeral home during the ceremony, you know? Boom, 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 dearly beloved, boom, 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 boom. Bounce it off the corpse's head. <laughs> yeah, hey, three points, nothing but net. <laughs> yeah, right. This old Italian widow with one of those veils on her head. Boom! Nothing but net. Uh, you ever notice some people are too happy? Like Richard Simmons driving around like a fat person in Santa Claus? Let me tell you something. If that guy ever came over my house with anything less than a million dollars and a six pack of beer, I'd punch him in his dealer mail head and throw his billow, brillo pad ass off my porch. And who else? That, that painter dude on TV? You ever see this clown? Who? That, that painter instructor, the guy that looks like he got a tumbleweed taped to his head? You ever see that dude? He, he, he is entirely too goddamn happy. What's this stuff, friend? What's this up, Steve? Uh, a happy little mountain and maybe a, f a friendly tree and over here, maybe just a happy rock. A happy rock? Yeah, there's something you see every day. Yeah, the other night I stayed home and with all my rock friends and oh, geez, we had a good old time. We, we were laughing and singing and what? Oh yeah, then I came down off my acid, Steve. <laughs> I think the guy is snorting the paint. What the hell is he doing? Happy rock. Okay, now I'm gonna get a little crazy. I'm gonna put a bush right over here. Why don't you paint the picture of your head? Bush can have a twin brother. <laughs> What's up with that guy's head? <laughs> That's what happens to you. He probably snorts a nice big line of yellow paint number nine and his hair just goes bang. Uh, good gruff. Who, who watches that shit? I think it's like a, like a comedy show. They just don't tell you. Like, it's, so, it's so awful, you can't take your eyes off it. Oh, man. It's probably some fat drunks who don't work and stay home all day. It's probably like a hillbilly. See this guy guy at home all shit-faced. <gasps> okay. I'm going to paint a happy little tree right here. And maybe next to this tree, <gasps> some friendly bear shit and let's give this bear shit some friendly little fries and 
over here some grass. It's my work. And in this grass, let's maybe put a corpse of the hitchhiker that I picked up. And let's say I raped them, and now we're going to hog tie them with this friendly little rope. It's their work. Uh, so shit, I think I'm gonna... Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Melvin, with a little bit of assistance from your host for today's show, Francis Domeno. Well, they're not, they're not, we're, gonna, we're gonna put Brian on some more, but the tape's almost out. And, you know, I wanted to do a little riff here, um, but no, stick around, because, like, uh, you, you ever, uh, you know, go out with girls, and you're really tempted to, like, you know, you always want to act serious and, uh, full of gravitas and like sort of like Richard Nixon on steroids like um well I, I, I take a very dim view of these proceedings I think those young punks should be horse with but you know instead she makes you feel so good you walk up to her and you go <laughs> I want to kiss you and hug you and kiss you and hug you and kiss you and hug you <laughs> yeah but you know that would never work so it's like Richard Nixon on steroids, or, you know, uh, four strokes wasn't good enough for that kid. It's I would have run him out of town on the rail. It's a facade. Yeah, Is that all, your point? It's all a facade. Thank you for cutting out the bullshit and cutting it to the quick. <laughs> well, you know, we're really glad to do this for you, folks, and if you feel like sending us all your money, well, I'm afraid we can't take it. We have to have it in the form of a check. Make it payable to Comedy on the Edge, care of the Middle East Cafe, for On the other hand, send the fucking cash. Man, who wants to declare this stuff on your taxes? 50-50 split, okay? Yeah. 10% to Steve here. He didn't do anything, but he was the audience. And, um, cool, you know? And we can get some really good drugs, and, and that way... Exactly. You know, talk for three hours. Necessities. Mm. Yes, um, like the nudist camp, bare necessities. Uh, what do they sell at a nudist camp? Uh, you know, sunblock? Sorry, we're strict nudists. We don't believe in sunblock. Uh, what do they sell at a nudist camp? Um, glasses for your penis. The nothing book. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, glasses, exactly. So, there you go. Uh, that's our topic for next week. Um, th hey, there you go. Spuds McKenzie. Cool. Um, mm. It's more chicks than we do, Francis. So. That's true. Even that guy that says, yes, I am, gets more chicks than we do. <laughs> right. That's a sad existence. It is...